Good morning. And welcome to today's service of worship. Please remember to fill out a prayer request slip if you have a prayer request, and um, our ushers today will pick those up for you uh, during the first hymn. There are a couple of things in particular I'd like to call your attention to in the bulletin this week. One of those is the, uh, the Peace and Global Witness offering. This is one of four annual offerings received throughout the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, we received this offering um, during the month of September, aiming toward World Communion Sunday, which is next Sunday as our day to, as our target date to receive offerings for uh, Peace and Global Witness. There is a bulletin insert that describes some of the different uh, particular, in this case, uh, peace making, peace related um, activities that are funded through the Peace and Global Witness offering. I would also uh, point out that 25% of what we give as a congregation stays here with us. And so it gives our Mission and Witness Committee an opportunity to, to do some sort of small project in our community as well from what we give for that offering. Uh, speaking of opportunities to share, sitting out in the narthex is a collection bin. Um, Grace United Methodist Church for many years has done a, a special program in October every year, and part of that is a winter clothing giveaway. And this year we have one of their collection bins. They collect um, winter outerwear for children and teenagers. And so if you are interested in participating in that, uh, please take a look at the, the information um, in the bulletin or on the bin itself, and uh, remember to bring those things in over the next couple of weeks. They reach some years literally hundreds of children through that, that event. So um, please, if you feel led by the Spirit, um, consider um, participating in that. And then just a general word that because we don't do our, for lack of a better word, ritual of offering during the service, we haven't been since the beginning of the pandemic, we don't offer our prayers of thanksgiving every week as we bring our offerings to the Lord. And so I would like to, on behalf of our, our session and our, and our finance committee, to offer a, a word of thanks to everyone for your continued faithful giving to support the work in the ministry of our church. We, um, we could not do things the way we do them without everybody's generosity. And uh, we are thankful to the Lord for providing for us in our own lives that we can share with others. So please know that these offerings that we leave in the plate are still offered to the Lord with thanks and, um, and prayers that those are used wisely and faithfully in the Lord's service. And then one other note, um, a couple of Sundays ago I mentioned that our administrative assistant Lois was uh, hosting a, a big event at the Spring Valley Presbyterian Cemetery, which is located just north of Morrison, out in the countryside. She is the chair of their board and has been working very hard at that over the last couple of years. That event a week ago Saturday was pretty well rained out. Um, and she, wanted, she sent me an email this morning, a text saying, please let people know that they are back out there again today, and they have yesterday. Uh, so if you want some place to go on a beautiful Sunday afternoon, um, I found it very easily just by typing into my Google Maps Spring Valley, Pres Spring Valley Presbyterian Cemetery, and I got very good directions. It's a beautiful country cemetery. Lois has poured her heart and soul into um, doing a lot of restoration work there and redevelopment work there, and would feel extremely blessed and encouraged if you have the chance this afternoon and are looking for a Sunday drive uh, it's a, um, a nice place to go. Lois had um, her first cataract surgery last Monday and did very well and is, will be back to work on a normal schedule this week and then a couple weeks from now she'll be having the second one done. And I know she appreciates all of your encouraging words as well and so many of you all, I haven't, I haven't reached that point yet, but I know so many of you of all have been through that and she has appreciated your encouraging and supportive words through all of that as well. We do gather together as God's people, as the family of God. 
And so as we unite our hearts together in love, let us worship the Lord together. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to its setting, praise the name of the Lord. We will bless God's holy name now and evermore. The glory of the Lord is high above the heavens, but God raises up the poor and needy on the earth. So we will sing God's praises. Let us worship God. Shall we pray? Lord, every year I asked my daughter what she wanted for Christmas, and she would reply, world peace. And I would reply, come on, Lisa, get real. Tell me what you really want. But Lord, maybe she was on to something. Maybe we should be praying not only for world peace, even though there should be an outpouring of prayers for the cessation of the carnage and atrocities which are continually occurring. But while praying for world peace, maybe we should include the prayer for peace within our community and also within ourselves. Maybe we should continually remind ourselves what you stated in John 14:27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give with you. I do not give to you as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled and be, do not be afraid. Lord, it is my prayer that we will all accept your promise of peace, not only in our tumultuous world, but also in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>
Will you join me in the prayer of confession? Loving, holy God, you invite us into a holy conversation with you in prayer. And even when we don't know how to pray, your spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. But we have neglected your great gift, or we have prayed selfishly, or we have ignored your command to pray for enemies. Forgive our foolishness, and restore in us a spirit of prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our loving God desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. reading today is Psalm 113. It says verses 1 through 9, but that's all Psalm 113. Uh, in my Bible, there's an annotation that says, Psalms 113 to 118 were traditionally sung at the Passover meal. The first two before the meal, the last four after. These were probably the last songs Jesus sang with his disciples before his death. You can find Psalm 113 on page 950 of your Bible if you would like to follow along. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, but stoops down to look on the heavens and on the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of their peoples. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. May God grant a blessing on his word.
The New Testament reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Paul, writing to Timothy, says, First of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and for all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Let's pray. Lord, shower us with holy manna. Feed us on the word of life, we pray. Amen. Through all the years I had the blessing of sharing my life with Lori, she was one of the most disciplined people I've ever known when it comes to prayer. During our Dixon years, when she was making the long to commute to Marengo several days a week, that meant that she was out of bed by 5 a.m. so she could be on the road by 6. A good part of that hour was spent sitting in her recliner with Melody the multi-poo snuggling in the seat beside her. In her lap were three things. The first, of course, was her well-worn Bible. The second was a notebook in which she kept, among other things, lists of people to pray for. I'm quite confident to say that if you knew Lori, 
she probably prayed for you by name. The third was a prayer guide called the Global Prayer Digest, produced by an organization called Frontier Ventures, which has resources in it for praying for the witness of the church around the world. Paul tells us to pray for everyone. And as much as anyone I've known, Laurie took that mandate to heart. It's a mandate that's impossible to fulfill, literally. And so many interpreters take it to be a piece of inspiring hyperbole. And others take it to mean that we should pray for all different kinds of people, including people like kings and people who are in high positions. So what are we to make of this challenging demand? We may get some help as we read along a bit further, where Paul gives us the basis for making this sweep, sweeping demand when he uses the word everyone a second time. He writes in verse 4 that God desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We are to pray for everyone because God loves everyone and wants each and every one of his children to live in fellowship with him and to experience the power of his redeeming love. There is no one beyond the bounds of God's concern. And as the scholar James Dunn puts it, that means that our Christian concern should exclude no one. There is no one that we should not pray for. There is no such thing as a do not pray list. As tempting as that thought might be sometimes. This may be behind Paul singling out those kings and people in high positions as a particular focus for prayer. Because if there were people those first or second generation Christians didn't want to pray for, the Roman authorities would have likely been on their list. When I read this about praying for kings, I can't help but think of the opening scene in Fiddler on the Roof. When Tevya, the milkman, is introducing the different members of the small Jewish community of Anatevka. As he introduces the rabbi, a man approaches the rabbi and asks him if there's a blessing for the czar. And he replies, of course. May God bless and keep the czar far away from us. <laughs> the followers of Jesus in a place like Ephesus at the time 1 Timothy was written likely had that same attitude toward the Roman emperor and the local authorities. We know that at times Christians suffered persecution at the hands of the state. And we know that the first communities of Christians were small minorities with no political power. And so Paul directs them to pray so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. It reminds me of what the Lord said to the prophet Jeremiah, to God's people living in exile in Babylon. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. Throughout history, there have been other times like that. Times when the best case for the people of God was simply to stay under the radar and to be left alone. And there are places in the world today where life is like that for many Christians, where they are a small and powerless and sometimes persecuted minority. But our circumstances are much different than that. So how should we pray for those people in high positions? My own approach to this was put to the test in a big way earlier this year. 
in the day shortly after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a group gathered on a Sunday afternoon at the Riverside to support and pray for the people of Ukraine. That gathering was organized primarily by our neighbors at First Baptist Church. Several people spoke and did readings, and there was some music. And then the clergy members who were present were asked to come to the microphone and lead in prayer. We were handed some slips of paper, and after a bit of shuffling of the papers around, I ended up with the one with the name Vladimir Putin. How was I to pray for Vladimir Putin? There was obviously not much time to think about it. And so when my turn came and I stepped to the microphone, I just had to follow what I felt was the leading of the Holy Spirit and the words that came into my heart. I don't remember the details, but I remember praying for the Lord to break Vladimir's hardened heart and to open his eyes to recognize the atrocities he was committing, and so on. What does it mean for us today in our interconnected world as citizens of a nation where we do have some measure of power to pray so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity? Does it mean simply to pray to be left alone? I was intrigued as I read one of the commentaries this week that when the author came to this point, he didn't write about peace, but maybe even unconsciously, he said, peace with justice. Because is it enough to pray just to be left alone? Or are we called to pray for our leaders so that there might be peace for everyone? a peace that will last because it is a peace with justice. When we pray for those kings and people in high positions, we should also remember that many of them, especially at the lower levels of government, serve as volunteers. They give countless hours of their time going to meetings fielding phone calls from unhappy constituents. And meanwhile, they have, in most cases, day jobs and families to care for and bills to pay. They suffer from illnesses and experience losses and grief. They are loved by God, gifted by him, and in need of his grace and forgiveness. Like you and I, they are more than their jobs or their positions. And so when we pray for them, we are not just praying for the job. We're praying for people who are like us. If we turn back now to the mainstream of this reading, how shall we take up this mandate to pray for everyone? we might begin by thinking about who we include on our prayer lists. And as we do that, it will be good to remember what I said earlier, that no one is beyond the scope of God's concern and saving love. So as we write those prayer lists, literally or in our minds, we will naturally begin with those who are near to us and those for whom we naturally feel compassion. But we might also want to ask ourselves, who are the people for whom we don't feel so much compassion? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So do we add to our lists people from whom we are estranged? And people we hear about in the news who infuriate us. As we build those prayer lists, we should also remember that Paul pray, tells us to pray for everyone because God desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so along with our prayers for their other needs, do we remember to pray for the spiritual well-being of the people on our prayer lists? As we say in our church's purpose statement, 
one of the primary reasons we are here is to prayerfully lead others to know the joy of God's love and to realize God's purpose for life's journey. When we lament over the future of the church, do we pray for this, that through us other people will come to know the joy of God's love? Do we pray for that in our prayers for everyone? And when we pray for everyone, how do we pray? Do we pray in broad, general ways, like for the people of Puerto Rico or Ukraine who are on our minds? Do we just recite lists of names, like God bless Aunt Sally? Or do we still ourselves and hold those people in our hearts and our minds? Do we pray with imagination and empathy? When it comes to praying for some of those people far away, there's something to be said for the old dictum about preaching with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. That might apply to our praying, too. For example, many news accounts these days include stories about people who are affected personally by a war or a natural disaster or a government policy. Holding those stories in our hearts and minds might allow us to pray as Paul envisions in the reading, making supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings praying in ways that engage our faith and love. Pray for everyone. Pray for people in high places and people without power in the world. Pray for those who are close to us and for those who are far away. Pray for friends and pray for enemies. Pray that all might live quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and dignity. Pray that all might know the saving grace and truth of God. Will we pray for everyone? Amen. As we come to this next hymn, two thoughts I'd like to share. One is just a coincidence that Two of our three hymns today were written by the same person, um, Fred Pratt Green, a, um, a relatively new modern composer whose um, hymns are sprinkled throughout our hymnal. Um, the second is we're singing a hymn called Now It Is Evening. Um, it is not evening, even though the sun seems to have gone behind the clouds and it might feel that way. Um, this is a hymn that I, I have a special um, affection for, but we never sing it because we're, it's never evening when we're together, or very rarely is it evening when we're together. But I chose it because it, it points us in the direction of those people around us that our scripture today calls us to pray for. So as we sing this together, please let our hearts and our minds go to those that are spoken of in this prayer, the children, the lonely, the neglected, the hungry, the stranger. Let's sing together.
And now let's pray. We praise you, holy and loving God, for your love for all people. That we praise you that you see each one. That you rejoice with each one. And that you bear each one's sorrows and burdens. Lord, you call us to join in your love and concern for all your children. You call us to pray for everyone. And Lord, we know that that is bigger than any of us. But we pray that you would open our minds and our hearts, that you would expand our circles of caring and prayer. And so in this time, we carry to you those who are especially on our hearts this morning. We join with Sherry in giving thanks that her mother Joyce, who's been in the hospital and then in rehab care, was able to go home on Friday. And pray that you would continue to strengthen her that she might flourish, and we pray for her and Leroy, that you would, you would bless them together. And we do bring to you those others, those people who have given us joy this week, those who are celebrating that we rejoice with, and we bring those to you that we weep with, that you would touch them at their point need. We pray for those in places of leadership. We remember, among others today, those who serve on our session. For Tom and Sarah, for Priscilla and Phil, for Bob and for our other Phil, and for Kathleen. We thank you for their service and hold them up to you and everything in their lives. We're thankful for the time that they give in service, for the concern that they carry for us, and pray that you would sustain them in every aspect of their lives. And we pray for those who lead our community. We remember our mayor, Lee Arlano, and pray for him and his family. We pray for the members of our city council. We pray for those who serve on our board of education, that you would encompass them and encourage them and give them wisdom as they deal with often complicated issues. We pray for our governor, Mr. Pritzker, and for those who serve in our state government. We pray in this election season for all of us as citizens to make wise choices. We pray for the leaders of our world, our nation. We pray for our president, Mr. Biden, for those who serve us in the Senate and House of Representatives, for the men and women who hold the awesome responsibility of serving on the Supreme Court. We pray for the leaders of nations, for the United Nations, whose representatives have been gathered together in New York this week, knowing that each of them is a person with their own concerns and struggles. We lift them all to you. We pray in the name of Christ our Savior, who taught us when we pray to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.